in the house of the Lord this morning. Brother Eli, you want to talk to Sunday school offering, please? He leadeth me beside the still waters. 
He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as always, when we're going to study something, at least when I study something, I like to tear it apart. What can I gather from this? Even the smallest bit of information can add meaning to something. So when we look at this passage here, we might start looking at things like who wrote it. So who wrote the book of uh, Psalm 23? David. David wrote Psalm 23. What might be some key words that we would find used throughout this passage? Shepherd. Shepherd. Is there anything else we might see in here, or is that all? Well, we might use death. For myself, I just stop at shepherd. If we want to get abstract, we could probably throw sheep in there because the whole thing is about the shepherd and a sheep. But the word that is used in this passage is shepherd. And it describes a shepherd over and over and over again. What about key phrases or key phrase? What might be a phrase that is used in this passage that might describe the entire Psalm 23? What is the verse? What's in the last verse, brother? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So we might say that that would be your key verse, brother, to describe the whole passage. But what about just a phrase? Well, in the house of the Lord forever. For myself, I lean towards the phrase, shall not want. Because while dwelling in the house of the Lord forever is good, when we look at the entire Psalm 23, it's not talking about dwelling in the house of the Lord, but it's talking about the shepherd's relationship with his sheep. And I went with the phrase, shall not want, because when you go down through the laundry list, uh, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He prepareth, prepares me a table in the presence of my enemies. When we look at that phrase, shall not want, as we'll talk about later, it means as long as I have my shepherd, there's nothing that I lack. And when we go throughout this passage here, we find that it's exactly what's being reiterated to the reader. As long as I have my shepherd, there's nothing else I need. Thou prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemy. I can eat. I don't have to worry about fear. Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're there. I don't have to worry about it. The desire of my heart may be to dwell in the house of the Lord, but everything I need, the shepherd has provided. So I went with the phrase, shall not want. And Brother Eli sums it up in the last verse when it comes to key verses. I myself obviously lean towards the first verse because for me that's where the summary was. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When we look throughout the entire passage of Psalm 23, it's discussing my shepherd. And it's also talking about everything I need, he provides. So that in a nutshell is what I found to be the key verse. Now, as we're looking through the Psalms, I like to bring out times that it's been quoted in the New Testament. Because when we get to the New Testament, whether Jesus quoted it, whether the disciples quoted it through the power of the Holy Ghost, it gives explanation to that passage or that verse or that phrase in the Old Testament. However, when we look at Psalms 23, everything I could find, it was never quoted in the New Testament. Psalms 23 holds special value for all of us, especially in the way that it's been incorporated into the church world through years past, and we have that pattern. When we're in times of deep, 
turmoil, um, turmoil, turmoil of soul, where do we go? Psalm 23. When we're in the uttermost um, turmoil of, soul, of our soul, and what I mean by that is when somebody passes, what do we refer to? Psalm 23. Because it is a comforting passage. So for us, it holds a tremendous special meaning. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not important. It just means that when it comes to the New Testament, from the best that I could discover, it was just never quoted. Well, if you have a chapter, you, you want to tell an Yes, sir, you will. Absolutely. The only connection we really see with this passage and anywhere in the New Testament is what we've already read this morning. And that is Jesus Christ describing himself as the Good Shepherd. I can discover nothing else to really compare this passage with the rest of the Bible as it's saying that it, this verse pops up or this phrase pops up. When we look at different passages of Psalms and years and weeks past, we said, well, we've taken this phrase and saw where it was uh, quoted in the New Testament. I don't see anything like that in Psalms 23. Psalm 23. Except for Jesus Christ referring to himself as the Good Shepherd. Now, since we're dealing with Psalms, we've been talking about their poetic style a little bit. To get a little bit of understanding, meaning, to see how maybe the Jews broke it down a little bit for themselves. Because we all know that there is a form of different forms of poetry. And the best I could find is that Psalms 23 would fall under what they refer to as the chiastic structure. What that really is, what we refer to as the inverted parallelism. We take, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then it's further abbreviated in, he makes me lie down in green pastures. So as we look at the poem itself, it's almost as if it does a V pattern. It comes this way, but then it reverts back the other way. As far as meaning and structure goes. And of course, that's all in your notes. Now, when we look at some of these psalms, some of them do have a history behind them. We'll talk about that more. One of my favorite ones is when we talk about the Sons of Poor. One with history behind it that we are probably familiar with is, I think, Psalm 61, where David cried, Created me a clean heart, O God. I mean, we all know from teaching and preaching that that's referring to David and, that, and his sin with Bathsheba, and he wrote that in connection with it. So it has a history behind it. We can point to yet and say, yes, David wrote, was a turmoil soul. He's writing this concerning his sin with Bathsheba. He's crying out to God. But when we look at Psalm 23, there is no real history behind it. There's nothing that pops out and says that, well, maybe David was going through this in his life. There's no passage or verse within Psalm 23 that says, well, maybe there was uh, a turmoil between him and someone like Absalom, and this is referring to Absalom. There's nothing in here that points to it. All it is is pointing to is the Lord is my shepherd and everything I need, he provides. There is no indication to a history behind it besides the fact that the author, David, sat down and penned a poem describing his feelings and his relationship with his Lord. When we look at this psalm, we are looking at Jesus Christ in it as well. How does this psalm portray Jesus Christ to us. According to Keith L. Brooks, this is the psalm of the shepherd, and it follows the psalm of the cross. Of the cross. We must, by experience, know the value of the bloodshed on Calvary's cross and see the sword awaken against the shepherd before we can truly know the sweetness of the Lord's care. Psalm 22 is the good shepherd dying for a sheep. As we already read in John 10, 11. Psalm 23 is the great shepherd caring for his sheep. Psalm 24 is the good shepherd coming again for his sheep. And there are verses to back that up as well. But for the sake of time, we're going to move on because I want to look at Psalm 23 in a little bit more detail. This is one of the more popular uh, psalms that we all know. And if we had to, we could probably quote the majority of it by heart. It's not a very long psalm. But what does it mean to us? So when we look at Psalm 23, how does it begin? The Lord is my shepherd. 
Does the Bible, does it begin with the Lord is your shepherd? No, it begins with the Lord is my shepherd. It means I don't know who you're serving. I don't know what lifestyle you're living. And you can come to church and look any way you want to like a good Christian, but I don't know what shepherd you're serving. But I know who shepherd I'm serving. Amen. And I know who he is. Amen. And then we get into talking a little bit more about who this shepherd is. He is the great shepherd. He is the good shepherd. And how does he conclude on verse 1? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Do you remember the rest of the verse? I shall not want. When we look at that shall not want, what does that mean? You don't want anything else. You don't want anything else? It's not just a matter of not wanting anything else, brother. But as long as I have it, I don't need anything else. Right. Because he provides for every single one of my needs. You know, so many times we fret over how am I going to pay my bills tomorrow? Or how, where am I going to get food? Or maybe where is the oil going to come from? Or how am I going to get heating done this winter? Or what's going to happen with my car? And there are so many worries and worries and frets in our life that we forget that he is all we need. He provides every single one of them. And if it wasn't enough to say the Lord is my shepherd, I know who I'm serving. I shout my one, I don't need anything else. The psalmist goes down, let me tell you about what else I don't need. Because he takes care of every single one of my needs. And he goes down and he starts to list them. He is my shepherd. It is personal. He is mine. And I don't need anything but him. And then we get down to verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. When we get to this verse, none of us would want to lay down where there's bugs all over. None of us would want to lay down in the thorns and the thistle, not sheep. None of us would want to go into a dry place and try to get some sleep. I mean, most of us, if we're sleeping in the winter, in the summertime, how many of us like to be cool? We don't want to be sweating. We don't want to be roasting. We don't want to have the sweat pouring off. Because when we do that, we're not in a comfortable state. Or in the time frame that we're living in, how many of us want to come out today to church without a coat? Or how many of us want to go to bed tonight in freezing cold with no blankets? Or we want to be comfortable. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. According to Philip Keller, he wrote a book, A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. And, which is a very good book. I recommend reading it. But it is literally a shepherd's look at each part of Psalm 23. And he describes in detail what might, is going on with the sheep, the shepherd, and different um, obstacles that they face. And he puts an actual um, shepherd's twist on it. But according to him, there are four things that sheep need in order to lay down. They need an absence of fear. They need to be free of friction from other sheep. They need to be free of pests. And they need to be free from the worry of finding food. Is that so far uncommon from any of us? I mean, if we're going to be comfortable, we have to know that there is no fear around us. We need to know that nothing's going to come out, nothing's going to harm us, nothing's going to attack us. If we are going through a difficult time in our life, how easy do we find it to go to bed and get rest and get sleep? It's not easy. We're tossing. We're turning. We're worrying. Or what about free from friction from other sheep? You know, has a dispute with somebody else ever kept us up at night? Has someone else, something that we might have to have a conflict with somebody else, even if it wasn't our fault and it was just them pushing it on us. How many times has that kept us up at night because somebody did us wrong? Maybe they're out gossiping about us. Or what about free from pests, bugs, gnats, friction in life? Whether it's 
what, how am I going to pay my bills to this that? All these things need to are requirements that must be met in order us, for us to sleep comfortably and to lay down um, and live peaceably. And when we talk about lying down in green pastures, what about just going on with our everyday life? You know, we can't go about our everyday life um, the way that we should if these things are present as well. And then finally we get free from the worry of finding food. If we were to be honest, we are not any different in that manner. We all like to eat. And we are all blessed in here today right now because at this point in life, we don't have to worry where our next meal is going to come from. We have food to eat. There's food in the pantry. And honestly, and right now I can sure with everybody here that if somebody did not have a meal right now, we would make sure that they had something to eat. We would make sure that they're taken care of. That is the last requirement that's needed for people, for sheep to lie down in green pastures. And the same is true with us. But yet, what does the Bible say when it comes to our needs? He shall supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. He rebukes us. Don't worry about tomorrow. Now, I'm not saying you go home, you sit down, and you don't do anything to make sure that the money's coming in. Because to go home, for me to go home, sit down, and do nothing, and not show up to work, and for God to expect God to pay for all my bills, that's foolishness. That's stupidity. If I don't have a meal on my table because of that, then that's my own downfall. But if we're striving and we're truly working, and we know that the Lord is our shepherd, and we're doing everything within our power that we can, and sometimes it just not, does not seem that that's not enough. You know, we look at there's a bill coming, how am I going to pay her? You know, God said, don't worry about tomorrow. If I clothe the grass of the field, how much more will I take care of your needs? If I don't take if I take care of the birds and the fowls of the air, how much more am I going to take care of your needs? And he goes through several different illustrations in that passage. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He'll take care of everything. I can lie down in green pastures where he leaves me because I know that he is taking care of absolutely everything. I have no reason to worry. Then we get down to, he leadeth me beside the still waters. You know, when we look at it from the shepherd's aspect, sheep will not drink from a babbling brook. There's too much commotion, there's too much clamor. So what does the shepherd do? He'll take that staff and he'll make a trench and dig something for that water to flow out of that and it can rest in a steady pool. Now God is like that with us. No, he will make us to drink from the fountain of living water where there is no fear or water. He will make sure that we can drink from a place that is to our life and our comfort because he is our shepherd and he knows exactly what we need. Then we go down to, I'm going to look at, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. There's one word in, the, in there that we forget so often about, and it is a key word, and that is the word shadow. We can have a dog come out and chase us. But if all the only thing that is nipping out our here heels is a shadow and he's behind a fence, we have nothing to worry about. That shadow cannot hurt us. Now there are many other examples that we can use about shadows, but it doesn't matter what we do. A shadow is nothing but a reflection of the image of the thing. Something that is cast down onto the ground. It does not matter what the shadow does to us. Growing up, I remember playing shadow tag. You touch the person's shadow with your shadow, they were in. When you touch the other person's shadow with your shadow, did they know it? Not unless they were directly looking at it. They didn't feel your shadow touch them. They didn't get pushed or knocked down by your shadow. Your shadow is just a reflection of your image. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The shadow of death is not death. We all know that if the Lord shall tarry, 
And he, we are not called home through a rapture. We will go by way of death. But for the believer, the person who knows that this is my shepherd, it is merely a shadow of death. Death is an enemy that has been conquered. He is a conquered foe. And though there may come times in our life, or even a time at the end, when we may see the shadow of death, the shadow of death can go like this and look like giant claws trying to bite our feet, but the shadow will never touch us or harm us. It is merely a reflection. The other thing that I see when it comes to a shadow is if you are in a completely black room, is there a shadow of anything? No. There is darkness. But in order to have a shadow, there must be light somewhere shining down. That reveals to us that even in the darkest points in our life, whether it's death, store, or before, that we may feel like all hope is gone, but it's only a shadow, and that there is a bright light up above that is protecting us, that is guiding us, and that is the Son of God. Just because death's shadow is being reflected down does not mean that there is harm coming our way. But when we see that shadow, we can rejoice knowing that my shepherd is up above and that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And death cannot touch the child of God in the sense that it does the unbeliever. The shadow is an indication that there is a presence of light somewhere. And that shadow can do no harm to the believer. And because of that, we can rejoice. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, because we know who our shepherd is, we know he is the Son of God. And because of that, there is no reason for us to fear. We shall fear no evil, for death is but a shadow, and he's already been conquered through the power of Jesus Christ and the work on the cross. Then as we go down a little bit farther, thy rod and I, thy staff, they comfort me. What is the purpose of the rod and the staff? Why, they are the weapons of the shepherd to fight off the enemy, to make sure that no wolves come their way. To make sure that nothing can harm his, he, his sheep. Yes, his rod, was, his staff was a correction tool for sheep that went astray. But if the Lord is my shepherd, are we going astray? We shouldn't be. If we hold him that dear, we should be wanting to dwell in the presence of the shepherd. You know, if you take several different shepherds, um, flocks of sheep and put them in the same fold that when that one shepherd calls his sheep it don't matter if they're all mixed up his sheep will come forth if we know the shepherd's voice we are his sheep we have been listening we have been obeying we have not been one of those wandering sheep that have gone astray and need correction but because of that his rod and his staff are a comfort to us because they're not out to harm us, but they're out to protect us. When the wolves come to get us and they come knocking on our door, when the enemy comes knocking on our door, we can rejoice knowing that the shepherd's fraud and his staff are there to ward off the, the efforts and the thwart, um, the effort and the attack of the enemy. No matter how hard they try, the shepherd's fraud and his staff are there to protect us. And when they are there to protect us, the sheep are not in danger are not in fear of danger. They can rest comfortably in those green pastures. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You realize that a shepherd will actually scout out months in advance the path which he plans to take his sheep for the for the summer journey. He will go and say, well, this looks like a good place for my sheep to eat and pasture and lay down. And because of that, he'll go scouting the area. He will look for any poisonous plants, and he will uproot them 
and take them far from that place and destroy them. He will make sure that it is a wide open area where he can see his entire shop flock that if a wolf or a lion should come trying to pick anything off, he has a clear vantage point to watch every single one of those sheep that no danger shall come their way. He places and spreads out salt and minerals in those places as well so his sheep would receive good nourishment when they actually feed upon those good plants and that grass. He will make sure that it is a good place for a sheep to eat and lay down, a place where their enemies will not be in their midst or be able to harm them. It says, I'll prepare us a table in the presence of my enemy. I did not get a chance to study this one out, so take it with a grain of salt. But I've heard before what that shepherd will also do is take a pot of oil and he will look for snake bowls. And any time he sees a snake hole, he'll pour oil down that snake hole. The purpose for it is that as the sheep are grazing on the top, those snakes, if they try to come up their holes, will slip right on down. Thou preparest a table before, before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. There are many pests that can cause affliction upon sheep, whether it be gnats or other worms. There's actually a, a, pet, uh, a parasite or a pest that actually gets into the nostrils of sheep and it drives them crazy and it will burrow in there and it will cause them to the point of trying to shake them off or run about, try them down, rub his head in the dirt and it will actually push a sheep to the point of exhaustion where it just falls over. It will cause conflict and damage, and it will grow in its nostrils. There are other pests that are out there with you as well. But when the shepherd places oil upon that sheep's head, it forces all the pests and keeps them away. It frees that sheep from anything that might cause a turmoil. All those little bugs. You know, God does the same thing with us. If the Lord is my shepherd and we're living right, we are building our relationship with him. And the more of God that we get, the more of the favor of God and the anointing we get from him. And when we are anointed of God, it's that anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. It's the anointing of God that gives us power over the enemy. It's that anointing that determines whether we're going to be a weak Christian or a powerful Christian. It depends upon our relationship with God. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. When we look at this phrase here, goodness alludes to all those good things in our life. All those blessings that God has given us, whether it's a good home, food on the table, clothing to wear, our relationship with God, but it, it does not just say all those good things, but it says, and mercy. Does mercy come when everything is going well? No. Growing up, I don't know if you've ever played with any friends or family or members. Uh, they called it mercy. You would take your knuckles and you would slap their knuckles and see who could do the hardest. And the one that would cry mercy was, well, they were the loser. It hurt too much. And I'm sure that, that Brother Dennis, you can think of many things throughout your life that boys growing up that did that were just as stupid, if not more, and you try to make each other give up, whether it be wrestling, leg wrestling, and the list goes on and on. Oh, yes. Mercy comes in times of turmoil and distress. So what we're looking at here is not just in the good times, but in the bad times. Our good shepherd is there. But and I love it. But surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Are we listening to the voice of the shepherd? Are we living the way we're supposed to be? Are we reading our Bible? Are we praying every day? Is he truly my shepherd? Or are we serving another shepherd? Because the truth of the matter is, as long as he's still my shepherd, even in the good times, 
And in the bad times, I can live peaceably. I don't have to fear. And I don't have to worry about any shadows. I don't have to worry about when the enemy comes in. Because I know as long as he's my shepherd, mercy will be there in those bad times. He will be there to take me through. And as long as he is my shepherd, brother Eli, I don't want to be in my house, but I want to be in his house. Amen. I don't want to be just out wherever I am, but I want to be where he is. Amen. And I want to dwell there, and I want to be as close to him as possible. Amen. And I don't want to be there for just a little bit. I don't want to be there for just a day or two. But we can go back and hopefully we are as Solomon was when the Queen of Sheba said what her breath was taken away. The Bible says that she actually fainted because never did she see somebody go worship their God the way that Solomon did. Man, if he was my shepherd, I'm going to do everything I can to be in his house. And we have emphasis in this last verse. It's not just anybody's house. It's not just my house. Or my shape, my shepherd's house, but it's the Lord's house. And when we look at the word Lord in the King James Bible, there, what, how is it described there in our King James Bible? What does it look like? A mansion. Not a mansion, but that word itself, Lord, in Psalm 23. Is it one capital L and lowercase O R D? Lord. It's all caps. And what do we know about the King James Version of the Bible when the word Lord is in all caps? It is describing him as Jehovah. Anything that you need, he is. When we look at that word uh, Lord, we go automatically right back to the very first verse. He is my shepherd. I shall not want. Anything I need, he's going to give me. I don't have to worry about food. I don't have to worry about where I'm going to sleep tonight. Because as long as he's my shepherd, he has all of my needs taken care of. As long as he's your shepherd, he has all of your needs as well taken care of. And he doesn't. He knows what I'm going through, and he knows what you're going through. All at the same time. And if he's my shepherd, and he's your shepherd as well, we are going to want to dwell in the house of the Lord every day from now until he death, for until eternity. And in the words of S.M. Uh, Lockridge, it is forever and ever and ever and ever. And it keeps going on. And when there's no more forever, then there's simply amen. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point in time? I like that shadow part. I never thought of it that way with the light of the Lord. That was good. Anyone else? Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and we shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high, that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should be our, that should come our way, Lord. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate, Lord. I pray that every single one of our hearts and our minds will be good soil for your word to fall, Lord. That we may take your word with us, that we would remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, Lord. That we would be transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ, Lord. And even now, right now, every single one of us that shall come together today, may our hearts and our minds be in one mindset and one accord. That not only may we worship you in sincerity and truth, but the, the devil himself and his minions would not be able to take foothold in this service, Lord. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your word today, Lord. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.